suggest if you ever see this guy talk about history or economics, completely disregard what he says. Now, he didn't get everything wrong, but let's go over the major things he did. We'll support coups, but as far as the coup goes, the U.S. didn't even know about it until two days before. The CIA documents have been declassified. I also hate Pinochet, but you'd go on to criticize him while completely glossing over Salvador. He had horrible economic policies that were very bad for the country. Wages went way down, hyperinflation, supply shortages, and he screwed up the entire copper industry, which was super important for Chile. He also allowed leftist militias to go around killing people who disagreed with them and killing business owners. As far as Pinochet's economics, it actually went really well. He was a terrible authoritarian, but he followed good advice from Friedman. Speaking of which, you said Friedman was sent by the U.S. to be an advisor to Pinochet. That's a lie. The University of Chicago had a pre-existing contract with a university in Chile. He went there and did some speeches, and he was very critical of Pinochet. He then gave Pinochet some advice on how to fix some issues, but he never supported him, and he was not sent by the U.S. As the Great Leap Forward was happening, natural disaster and famine struck China. The leader who took power at- Getting just a little tired of seeing Mao apology on my For You page, so let's make this quick. The famines were mostly due to human error, not natural disasters. In 58, when the Great Leap Forward started, they had abnormally good weather. They were over-optimistic and ate most of the harvest, thinking 59 was going to be the same. There were worker shortages due to farmers going to factories to work, such as the steel factories, where they messed up most batches of steel. There was the Four Pass Campaign, specifically the Smash Sparrows Campaign. Mass killing of sparrows caused a severe ecological imbalance. The population of bugs who were their prey boomed and they ate plants. There was also insanely high food quotas for factory workers. Once they were met, there was barely any food left for farmers. People were upset with Mao because he was so bad at managing things, so he carried out mass executions. During the Great Leap Forward, an estimated 2.5 million people were murdered, and 1 to 3 million committed suicide. But oh, Benjamin, you know that capitalism is a system based on constant growth. And as it grows, it grows out of the stage of free competition and into a stage of monopoly capitalism and imperialism. So this is basically what happens when you know more about Marxism and Leninism than actual economics. Lenin did not dictate how economics works. Number one, capitalism does not need infinite growth. Number two, capitalism can do infinite growth. Number three, capitalism does not cause monopoly. There's two types of economic growth, extensive and intensive. The former is what you are describing when we need more input. The latter is when we use inputs to do more. And I wish I had more time, but let's talk about monopoly. During the 19th century, when local governments were beginning to grant franchise monopolies, the general economic understanding was that monopolies were caused by government intervention. Blaming monopolies on the free market is a more recent thing that's been used by governments to justify overreach. Before regulation got into public utilities, competition was very common. There would be many options in one city, whereas nowadays you have one or two. But the burden of proof would fall on you to prove natural monopolies. Milton Friedman's idea that privatization is always best is only so popular because billionaires have pumped tons of money into it. First of all, that wasn't Milton Friedman's belief. Second of all, it's popular because it's good. And it's proven to be good over and over again. But continue. In reality, historically, this idea that privatization is always better for everyone is just laughably wrong. At one point, Bolivia, under pressure from the West, privatized their water supply, which led to people not getting water because the price of water shot up when people started profiting off water. Eddie, if you actually did any reading past Wikipedia articles, you might actually be able to win debates. So let's take a little read, shall we? The Water Authority raised tariffs right before privatization, and that was the cause of price hikes not privatization. Again, this is not hard to look up. Not only that, but the privatization actually expanded access to water for low-income people and helped with water inequity. In other words, privatization helps the poor people and then the government ruined it. This seems to be the trend in all of your examples. As for your take on Bolivia, you're wrong as usual. Mr. Communist did a great video talking about how you were misinterpreting the study. Hey, Eddie, go ahead and explain how I was wrong instead of referencing someone else's video because you just did that because you didn't want to read. And you don't even know how I was wrong. Because in my video, I said that privatization expanded access to poor communities. I was correct. He agreed with me. I also said government tariffs contributed to higher prices. He agreed with me. He just added on that some companies raise prices themselves, which I never disagreed with. So what was I wrong on, Eddie? And then you recommend a movie. Because again, you don't read. Also, I think it's funny how you saying me saying I won the debate is me doing something with my ego. When immediately after the debate, you went to your own comment section and started saying that you won and that libertarians are stupid. Meanwhile, I made a video saying that I appreciated you guys coming and talking to me and I thought you guys were good faith. Matt also did the same thing. He immediately started criticizing us. I was the one trying to have a good conversation. You were the one acting like it was a contest. But keep lying to yourself. 
Check out this study comparing quality of life in socialist countries versus capitalist countries during the Cold War. The study finds that socialist or state capitalist countries, whatever you want to call them, were able to create a much higher quality of life. So a few weeks back, me and Eddie had a debate on communism and he brought up this study. I then proceeded to debunk it right in front of him. And here he is using it again. It just shows how intellectually dishonest he is. So he not only directs his fans to go read fascist collaborator websites and supports prominent anti-Semites, but he quotes studies that he knows are false and that he never read. So let's talk about his study. First of all, they didn't compare a single one of the socialist countries to a capitalist country. In fact, many of the capitalist countries were run by socialists. They also didn't account for how long a country was socialist or capitalist. They also used blatantly false data. For a few examples, look at this about Cuba, and this debunking the claim that Soviets had a high calorie intake. Also, Eddie ignores a plethora of other studies that show the exact opposite of his claims, that economic freedom brings better quality of life. These three, for example. The news outlets I use to escape Western hegemony, the Gray Zone. In this video with 56,000 likes, Eddie recommends the Gray Zone as a media outlet. I looked into this outlet and its founder and found some, uh, questionable things. Max Blumenthal established the Gray Zone in 2015. Max has very close ties to the Kremlin, kind of like the TikToker Soapbox who is funded by the Kremlin. Max has appeared in Russian state media alongside with anti-Semite Charles Bozeman. Charles Bozeman founded Russia Insider, which publishes anti-Semitic and Nazi sympathizer articles. Back to Max, he frequently spreads false stories such as this one, where he sources Richard Edmondson, who is a Holocaust denier and blames Jews for 9-11. Max also wrote this book, Goliath. In his book, he compares Israelis to Nazis and calls for the ethnic cleansing of Jews from Israel. The book is loved by white supremacists such as Fraser Cross, who murdered three Jews, and in general was a big fan of Max Blumenthal. And all of this is just scratching the surface. I think Eddie should stop recommending people like this. I have to say I was not expecting to read a comment this dumb today, but yeah, let's go ahead and go over this. Here is the real wage growth under Allende. The orange lines mark the beginning and end of his term. You can see he didn't do such a great job. When his term ended, inflation was at 150%. Food prices rose, exports fell by 24%, imports rose by 26%. The overall standard of living did not increase. They faced food shortages and their nationalized industries had drops in productivity just like Mises predicted in 1920. Now we enter Pinochet's economy. He asked for Milton Friedman's advice on how to fix the mess Allende left. Friedman advised him to free up the markets and to free up the people politically. He gave an entire speech against Allende's authoritarianism. Pinochet tackled the inflation problem, GDP growth went through the roof, per capita real income started rising 5% per year, which was way above the rest of Latin America. Infant mortality rate went from 76.1 per 1,000 to 22.6 per 1,000. So yeah, Eddie was wrong. Hi, I work as a COVID tester at a nursing home and I wanted to show you the difference between the government tests we get and the tests we get from a private company. So right here, this is the government test and these cost about $4 per test. Um, all you do Eddie, I really don't get this video at all. It, it, it literally makes no sense because you're comparing two tests and saying one is government and one is private, but both were made by private companies. Not only that, but it's so weird that you're comparing them because the Abbott one is a molecular diagnostic test and the Sophia 2 one is an antigen test. They're two different types of tests, so you can't directly compare them. So when you're talking about one has more plastic and costs more, it's because it's two different types of tests. And when I was like looking for articles on private testing versus government testing, pretty much all I could find was stuff that actually supported that private testing was better. And that problems came from the government holding back the private sector. So the video isn't only confusing, it's really wrong. Over one third of the world's access fish hatcheries are being pushed beyond their biological limits due to overfishing. The only problem is that capitalism doesn't incentivize corporations to control the amount of fishing they do to allow the hatcheries to repopulate. Actually, that's exactly what capitalism does incentivize. The problem here is not capitalism, but rather the tragedy of the commons. If you have resources on commonly owned land or water, then people are not incentivized to control their consumption. But if they're limited to their own privately owned land, then they are. If I'm limited to my own fishing area and I overfish it, that will be long-term loss. I'll make short-term profits, but in the long run, it is not good for me. If I want to make actual profits in the long run, then conservation is ideal. And empirically, this has proven to be the most ideal solution. Many different privatization experiments have brought overwhelming success. This also applies to many other things, such as trees or endangered animals. You can't say that capitalists care about profits, but then say they won't conserve their own private land, because that's not profitable. There are many
many Muslims and Christians who look at their faith and think it should put them on the left. Because of course religious teachings can be in line with left-wing ideals. It's all about feeding the hungry, curing the sick. Being nice to people and helping people doesn't equal left-wing. Christianity is not compatible with leftism, especially not Marxism. Marxism is a materialist ideology, it's contradictory to Christianity. Leftism includes anti-individualism and private property rights, beliefs that you should force people to help others rather than letting them do it of their own free will. And free will is very important to Christianity. Christianity repeatedly establishes private property rights. It praises entrepreneurship and when people ethically build up more money. It tells people to respect wage contracts. Now certainly people, specifically Christians, it's specifically Christians, are told to give, but it's to give voluntarily not to be coerced by a megastate. It also establishes that those who are actually able to work should work or they shouldn't eat. This is pretty contradictory to leftism. If you're interested in more, I suggest picking up a book like this. Capitalist simps keep saying debunk the ECP. Yeah, why don't you guys debunk the fact that in communist countries 200 people died of COVID and in the capitalist countries 400,000 people died? Hmm, what system allocated resources the best there? It's important to note that those who argue with the ECP want a free market economy, not a mixed economy like the US. Anyways, this first argument from Eddie has nothing to do with the ECP, but let's go over it anyways. Cuba had a huge increase in acute respiratory diseases in 2020. This leads epidemiologists to believe that Cuba's numbers are largely understated. But the economic impacts of COVID has led Cubans to want to embrace capitalism. In fact, one of the Castros just resigned. This news broke one hour ago. In the coming years, we will see great improvements in Cuban quality of life. In communist countries, they build hospitals in five days. It was actually 10 days and it was functional in 15 days. They also hired private companies to do this. In order to do this, they ignored a lot of labor regulations that you support. That's why it would be impossible in the US. But the ECP is about productive efficiency, which China is very bad at, especially their public firms, which proves the ECP. Back to the US, again, we have many laws that keep us from building hospitals this fast, especially since we have central planning when it comes to hospitals, which decreases hospitals by 48% and beds by 12%. Thoughts on the purges in the USSR. The purges took place from 1936 through 38. Keep in mind the dates he mentions here. All the purges had a purpose, and that purpose was to win World War II. He just said the purges were from 36 to 38, and then he said it was because of World War II. Well, Russia didn't enter World War II until 1941. And in 1939, Stalin made a pact with the Nazis. This actually contradicts a lot of things Eddie says later on. The book Khrushchev Lied by Grover Fur basically claims that the entire secret speech was fabricated. Eddie cites Grover Fur, who was a well-known historical denialist and genocide denier. Keep in mind, a lot of those who were purged were literally collaborating with the Nazis. Uh, Ah uh, yes, Stalin killed people for collaborating with Nazis and then collaborated with Nazis one year later. Eddie claims 1.2 million people were Nazi collaborators with zero evidence. And as for those people, I would rather see them purged than see them in our intelligence agencies, like the CIA in Europe did with former Nazis. And also the Soviet Union did that, which he completely neglects to mention, of course. You're not an alpha male because you're a right winger who doesn't think people should have health care. Leftist discourse has become so incredibly toxic. Like, they can't actually critique people, so they just lie about them. Oh yes, right-wingers just don't want people to have health care at all. They want everyone to just literally die. Like, they literally think in their head, I want everyone to die. That's so totally true. Eddie blocked me because he was upset I kept refuting his videos. He would lie to people, and he unironically supports genocide. The dude defended Stalin's purchases, North Korea, the concentration camps in China. People like him are practically Nazis. And then they turn around and say, oh, the libertarians just don't want people to have health care because they have to lie in order to make us look bad because we consistently make them look stupid. Me and Alex make Eddie look stupid for a solid two hours. Go check out this debate. And I've made videos about the times Eddie has endorsed Nazis and defended genocide and lied to everyone over and over again. Thoughts on socialism destroying Venezuela? Yeah, the U.S. is holding $342 million of Venezuela's money. You know, I have to say, I always thought communists were really dumb, but Eddie proved me wrong. Because after all, he just invented time travel right in front of us. Because this sequestering of money in 2019 started causing problems all the way back in 2007, and especially 2014. Now that I hear it, it's incredibly obvious. Of course, the economy crashing in 2014 was caused by sanctions in 2017 and freezing money in 2019. It absolutely was not the result of all the nationalized industries that had huge drops in efficiencies. It was not a result of the over 100,000 co-ops that were started, most of which failed. And it was not the collectivization and price controls in the agriculture industry that caused that to fail. It was all the stuff that traveled back in time and caused this. It wasn't socialism, it was America. It's all America's fault, guys. In fact, it's capitalism. It's literally capitalism that caused all this. This is why we need communism, guys. 
I think by now a lot of people know about the genocide China is committing against the Uyghur Muslims. But several content creators have been defending the genocide or gaslighting people about it, even saying it's not even happening. Adrian Zenz is a respected researcher who has given us a lot of data on this situation, so these guys use deranged Chinese state propaganda sources to try to slander him. And if you criticize them for doing this, they'll say you're racist toward Chinese people. Stop you right there, because that sounds a little xenophobic to say that any media that comes out of China is automatically unreliable. Gaslighting. State propaganda is unreliable. Adrian Zins made a career off of calling what was happening in Tibet a genocide. In 2020, Reuters put out a report that corroborated Zen's research, and Robert Barnett, who was the director of modern Tibetan studies at Columbia University, defended Zen's against the Chinese state media. If you break it down, you can see that the birth rate and growth rate for the Uyghur population is higher than that of the majority. On his medium, Zen's responded to critiques of his data. So read that and also check out these other defenses of Zen's. And remember, these are the same tactics people used to deny the Holocaust as it was happening. Well, if the U.S. wanted to promote women's rights in Afghanistan, they should have supported the Marxist government who came to power in the 70s. One of their first policies was equal rights for women. Ah, see, but they didn't do that. Instead, they backed and funded Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen who were fighting against the communists. So for some reason, leftists look at the whole thing that happened in Afghanistan and are like, hey, now time to be super pro-imperialism. Because they sit there and bring up all this stuff, which most of it is just lies, and then pretend the Soviets literally didn't exist. So essentially this goes back to the coup in 1973, which was done by socialists. You know, they always complain about the US-backed coups. Well, this was a Soviet-backed coup. The Socialist Party took over from there and did a really bad job. Like, I don't think that equal rights for women matter if you're out there in the streets massacring people and you assassinate people from opposition parties. It was an extremely bloody time. In fact, the Soviets began looking at them going, oh wait, these people are way more violent than we want. And that was the Soviets saying that, so you know it was pretty bad. One particularly bad character was President Amin. He didn't last very long because the Soviets invaded in Christmas of 1979 and killed him. After the Soviets invaded and started killing Afghanis, other people like Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen are like, hey, we need to go fight these people. And they were financially backed by the Pakistani service intelligence, who were financially backed by Saudi Arabia, the US, and China. So the US was not directly funding Osama and the Mujahideen like Eddie claimed. In fact, originally the US was donating for non-lethal aid towards the Soviets' opposition because the Soviets were terrible. Now, of course, Osama ended up being terrible, but the thing is, you're like, oh look, this is a bad person, but you're forgetting the other people who were even worse, which were the Soviets. The Soviets didn't pull out until 1989. And this started because of Soviet imperialism. This is absolutely not to say everything else, everyone else did, especially the US was okay, but when you're sitting there trying to say, oh, I'm against imperialism, but you're vehemently defending the Soviet Union's imperialism, going as far as to not even mention it, that's pretty bad. All of these communists who were popping up in the Middle East, this wasn't because they were just reading Karl Marx. This was a direct result of Soviet imperialism. The same with Latin America. If people have such a wonderful time condemning the US for all the things they did in all these countries, why can't they say the same about the Soviets? If you hate capitalism that much, then why don't you move to Venezuela? Oh, you messed up, Jordan. I've been waiting for you to slip up and say something dumb on this app. A lot of people requested I make a response to this video where Eddie vehemently defends dictatorships in Venezuela. And he unironically thinks socialism was a success in Venezuela. Yeah. But honestly, I need to focus on people who will actually be challenging. So this is probably the last video I'll make on Eddie. Western capitalists like you suck the oil out of Venezuela for years until that's what their economy was dependent on. This statement is absolutely nonsensical. How does siphoning the oil out of the country and not making it benefit the country's economy make the economy dependent upon oil? It's also just blatantly objectively false. Venezuela's super dependence upon oil clearly came from the socialists, especially once they started all these social programs that were funded by oil money. Because these social programs now replace other aspects of the economy and they also make people work less and stuff like that. So now all of that is dependent upon oil and that was a decision made by the central socialist planners reinvested a lot of that oil revenue in social programs. This decreased poverty by 25%, illiteracy by 49%. Venezuelans got more cash. This does not mean they were better off. It's easy to just gather a bunch of money and throw it out there. And now suddenly people are above this poverty line. But what about your buying power? What about your debt? What about the sustainability? The fact that so many Venezuelans are in poverty today shows that was unsustainable. If you can have this vast reduction in poverty, but then it's reversed in a couple of years, that's completely useless. Chavez brought Venezuelans from owing $1,400 each to owing $3,400 each. 
crime increased, Venezuelans were three times more likely to be murdered after Chavez. What about those famed literacy programs? These were quote-unquote an expensive failure, at most a small positive effect on literacy rates. The U.S. put 160 sanctions on them and surrounded the country with our military so we can steal anything they try and trade. So you see, Jordan, Venezuela didn't fail, they're being strangled to losers like you. This whole idea of blaming sanctions for the failure is quite ridiculous. It is an absolute cop-out. Let's look at actual evidence from real researchers instead of Eddie's blog. The bulk of the deterioration in living standards came long before the sanctions were enacted in 2017. Eddie believes in time-traveling sanctions. They traveled back in time and caused the collapse before they even existed. Maximum amount of daily calories that can be purchased with a minimum wage in Venezuela. Dropping, 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 and then sanctions. This is like me stuffing my face with 20 donuts a day. 60 days in, I'm gaining weight, and then I add in an extra Jolly Rancher per day. 60 days later, I see I've gained so much weight, and then I blame it on the Jolly Rancher. Obviously, the Jolly Rancher didn't help, but it wasn't the root problem. Again, GDP was on decline, oil production was plummeting. This was way before the economic sanctions. And there's so many other failures too. All of the blackouts and brownouts that came after they nationalized electricity. The loss of productivity in the nationalized steel industry. The absolute ruined agricultural industry once they nationalized it. The government even helped start over 250,000 worker-owned firms. And in just a few short years, even before the sanctions, there was less than a quarter of those left. They all failed because your policies don't work. They never have. Never. Yeah, there's been a lot of successes of socialism, but honestly, Bolivia might be the best one. A lot of people think I'm just this hardcore Marxist-Leninist, but I'm a huge fan of how Evo Morales and other Latin American leaders have come to power in this century. So when people say socialism doesn't work, so oftentimes they talk about the Soviet Union or Venezuela, which are great examples, but there's some that kind of slip through the cracks, and we're going to talk about a few of those ones in a few of my next videos. Bolivia is the first one. It's often cited as a large socialist success. There's been a lot of articles in the media about Evo Morales reducing poverty and bringing about huge economic success. They'll cite things like the huge increase in GDP growth, but it was not socialist policies that drove this economic growth. It came from the natural gas boom as shown here. Now this boom actually started after the natural gas was privatized. They then nationalized it around this point. But one of the differences between their nationalization and Venezuela's oil nationalization is they actually handled it much better. Instead of full-on government control like in Venezuela, they actually still have private oil companies, which some of them have a majority share owned by the government or they're contracted by the government and there's still competition. Now this is not desirable, however it is much much better than what Venezuela did. There also has been a good amount of freedom kept for small to mid-sized businesses, which is very good. Evo Morales is definitely a lot smarter and pragmatic than a lot of other Marxist leaders. Now just because there was a natural gas boom doesn't mean that Evo Morales didn't actually contribute anything. He did incorporate a lot of social policies. But, unfortunately for the socialists, there was a great synthetic control analysis that came out in 2019. This actually came out after a lot of the articles praising Bolivia as a socialist success. Synthetic control analyses are highly praised in economics because they're the best way to find out the effects of certain leaders or policies in a country. And Bolivia actually underperformed compared to the controls. The real Bolivia's growth was slightly less than the synthetic Bolivia. Evo Morales and his policies actually caused a 4.7% drop in GDP per year. In other words, this is not a socialist success, it's actually a net negative. But you can give Evo a little bit of credit, at least he didn't do significantly worse. But Bolivia still has the problem of not actually diversifying its economy more than it should. This is already leading to some problems currently and might lead to a lot more in the future. But that's what happens when you have central planners and mass welfare policies instead of a natural market. So let me know if there's any more socialist success stories you want me to debunk.